First, I wanted to start off with thanking our sponsors of our educational seminars. Our two sponsors are uh, the Beef Educational Endowment Foundation and Call Your Farms Beef Masters. They've sponsored all the seminars yesterday and today. So thank you for those sponsorships. Um, we're able to bring speakers from all the way from Washington, DC because of their sponsorship. So uh, this is obviously the NCBA policy update. Um, Ms. Caitlin Glover of the public, she serves as the executive director of the Public Lands Council and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association Natural Resources. And prior to joining PLC in 2020, uh, Caitlin served as a policy advisor on agriculture and natural resources and tribal policy issues in the United States Senate. And before moving to Washington, D.C., she also worked on uh, several projects in Ireland, and, but she originally grew up in Wyoming. So she has literally been all over the world, and, but she is in Oklahoma City with us today. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Caitlin Glover. Thank you, ma'am. So I need to turn this one off. Oh, you did. Okay, excellent. Well, good morning. Uh, and despite my travels all around the world, it is sure good to be uh, here home adjacent. So appreciate you having me this morning. Um, as Gerilyn said, I serve as Executive Director uh, of Government Affairs for NCBA in Washington, D.C. Uh, there are three of us. There are three executive directors who lead our natural, or to lead our government affairs teams. Uh, the, those two, the, there are three teams, right? The A team, the B team, and the C team. And I lead the C team, not because it's least important, uh, but because a lot of what Washington wants to talk about these days is climate, right? So I lead the natural resources team. The A team, the animal health, the cattle health and well-being team uh, is the A team, the B team, is the business team, but all three of those teams have essentially a singular goal, and it's to make sure that cattle producers in this country can use the knowledge, the market access, and the skills that they have to make as much money, produce the highest quality product, and do so essentially without interference from the government. The market scenario, the sustainability, both cultural, social, environmental, and economic are our top priority. And so a lot of the things that I'm gonna to talk to you about today uh, are, are, are gonna come back to that, that, that concept of durability, longevity, and, and sustainability. Um, you know, I, I always title this slide uh, a policy update because that's, I'm gonna talk to you a lot about policy and, and what happens uh, in, in the town where I now find myself. Um, but a better title for this slide is probably what the heck is happening in that town, right? Because normally that's what people ask me. They call me and they say, what is going on? <laughs> what, 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 what's happening and, and what does it mean for me? So I want to start this morning um, by talking about the Supreme Court, right? And there's going to be some text on this slide. I don't want you to read all of it because we'll, we'll talk about the most important parts. Um, but as we sit here in October 2022, uh, all of the members of Congress are, uh, all of the members of the House are back in their home districts campaigning for their lives and for their seats. A third of the United States Senate is doing the same. Uh, and the agencies are taking well, a little bit of a break which usually happens before an election, but are dropping some pretty strategic uh, and campaign-focused regulatory activities. And so I want to start with the Supreme Court this morning because as we talk about the three branches of government, the Supreme Court has probably been the most active over the last month and a half. Supreme Court has a number of cases that they hear during their session. This fall session started with our favorite water issue, Waters of the United States. And while the EPA is promulgating their own rulemaking, they've rolled back the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, they've said we want to do our own thing uh, during the Biden administration, the Supreme Court said, hold on a minute, we, we have some thoughts here. So the first case out of the gate for this fall session was Sackett versus versus EPA, uh, essentially determining which test, whether the significant nexus test or the relative permanence test, are the tests to use for when the EPA is saying, hey, 
we have jurisdiction here. This is a waters of the United States. Now, it, it's going to feel a lot like 2015 for a little bit this morning because we're going to be talking about WOTUS, we're going to be talking about NEPA, and a lot of things that sort of come back around in that natural resource space. But this one is particularly important. Because as we look at this particular case, six of the nine seated justices on the Supreme Court are considering this issue for the first time, are considering waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act for the first time. The court in itself, right, the whole body, has considered it four times in the past, including this Sackett versus EPA case. But this was the first time that th this court, seated the way they are, 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 are sort of delving into some of these natural resource issues. And I know that every single person in this room watched those or listened to those oral arguments earlier this month, right? Absolutely. Um, but, but if you did, what you would have heard was that there is a, a pretty significant level of interest in where the government draws the line. And some of these new justices are, are trying to figure out how, for themselves whether the government has a more expansive role or, or a less expansive role. Now, the attorneys for the, the Sackett family uh, who are, are saying that you know, this, this government determination not only was not in their favor, but the government didn't have the jurisdiction to designate a WOTUS. Uh, the, the, the attorneys for that family say that there might be a different combination of those tests. Remember that relative permanence or significant nexus. Whether it's close enough to navigable waters to matter and whether it has enough water in it to be a significant point source. Um, and and there, there is a combination. NCBA filed an amicus brief in this case because we do believe that there should be a multi-factor decision-making process for the EPA to go through. It shouldn't just be that there is a pond somewhere or a ditch that runs for a week or two out of the year or some isolated feature that should trigger government intervention. Because again, remember that as our policy states, we know that you do, you know what to do. You adopt the best practices because not only are they the most profitable, they are the most durable for the future of your operations. That includes natural resource management. So in all three of these bottom here, I don't want to hit a button because I might turn it off, but in the, the, the second, third, and fourth bullet, you, you, you see that the court is going to, to hear or have already heard oral arguments. Those decisions are expected in early 2023. But all three of those decisions are going to be influenced by that first case, that West Virginia versus EPA, which essentially is going to create a new decision matrix for, for agencies when they want to see how far they can go in putting out and implementing and enforcing federal regulations. Essentially, this is the governor. This is the limit on some of these outside climate policy and regulatory activities, whether it's waters of the United States, whether it's the Interstate Commerce Clause in the National Pork Producers Council versus Ross, or whether it's Wilkins v. U.S. that they'll hear later this month. The only other thing that I want to talk about here this morning is this NPPC versus Ross case. And, and I think this is particularly important for what all of you do. So some of you will be familiar with Prop 12. California uh, had a proposition that voters adopted in 2018 that essentially said that pork, uh, that pig products, pork uh, that were produced using gestation crates in California or in any other state would not be eligible for sale in California. Now states do things within their own state borders at any time, right? You know, that, that there are delegated authorities for a reason. But this particular case, this particular proposition triggered the Interstate Commerce Clause, the Dormant Commerce Clause. And the question that the Supreme Court is going to have to answer is, can California tell everyone else what to do? Can one state adopt a policy that interrupts interstate commerce because of an in-state policy? Now, I, I think you would have heard, because I know you all tuned into this one too, but when the Supreme Court heard these oral arguments, I think you saw a, a number of those justices saying that, look, you know, there, there are delegated authorities for a reason, but this is an incredibly slippery slope because it doesn't just apply to interstate commerce. It applies to healthcare policies. It applies to transportation. It applies to everything in this country that crosses state 
state boundaries, and that's a heck of a lot of things, not just things that are going to be sold. And, and so, you know, as, as we have spent our time in, in, uh, in Washington this month, a significant portion of our attention has been aimed and, and, and focused on the Supreme Court. Because those oral arguments are often indicative, the engagement in those is often indicative of way, where those justices are going to land early next year. And of course, early next year is immediately after the election, right? We're going to have a new Congress seated in early January. And don't worry, we'll talk about the election later. But I want to talk to you about the important stuff first. Because no matter who is elected, no matter who is in those seats, a number of these issues are going to be the same. Whether it's me or Sally down the road in that chair, the issues that confront this industry and a number of others are going to continue. So let's talk about regulations, because those are the things that move through the agency process, regardless of whether Congress is in session or where the president happens to be that day. And the one that I want to highlight for you first this morning, and trust me, there are a bevy of regulations, uh, is this Security and Exchange Commission greenhouse gas reporting rule. Now, most of you will be familiar with the SEC because they are involved in business practices, right? They, they are typically engaged with things on Wall Street, not out in the country where all of us live, all, all of us operate, right? But the SEC decided to, to go big. And, and often you see this in Washington, right? You go big or go home and you, you issue expansive proposed rules and then have a little bit of a reality check when everyone says you can't actually do that. And that's really kind of what, what has happened here with the SEC greenhouse gas rulemaking. So without getting too in the weeds here, there's one part of this rulemaking that is particularly concerning for ag producers. And it's this scope three emissions, a part of this this greenhouse gas disclosure rule that essentially would say that every any publicly traded company that sold any sort of beef product or any ag product for that matter would need to disclose the full supply chain emissions data in selling that product. So that's not just the uh, enteric fermentation methane emissions that you know we talk so much about, right? That's not just the emissions from transportation for, for vehicles. That is everything from the tires that you put on the pickup to go to town to make the feed order. It, it is everything in that supply chain, right? And that's not only impossible to do, right? That is an, an immense regulatory burden that is entirely unreasonable. It's outside the scope of what the SEC can do, right? They, they went big. They, they swung for the fences. Uh, and, and what we have told them as NCBA and as a number of, of other commodities uh, who would fall under this scope three or supply chain emissions is that this is an improper extension of their authority and it would place an incredible regulatory burden on those who are going to essentially not be able to comply with, uh, with with federal regulation. It's not their job, they don't have the expertise, and it would require a level of disclosure that's entirely un unacceptable. And so, you know, some of these regulatory items, whether we're looking at, you know, the, the SEC rule or a number of these others, a lot of times, most of the time, NCBA's role, our partner's role, is to remind the government what they can do, what they can't do, and also the things that they shouldn't do. And this is certainly, uh, this is certainly one of those examples. We do expect to see a final rule before the end of 2022. So, uh, you know, I, I'd never make plans at Christmas, uh, not because of the, the the infamous cow who will not be named who ruined Christmas a number of years ago uh, but but honestly because this particular administration I think is going to be prone to issuing rulemakings at the end of December but it's not just the SEC that we are involved with, right? I put a few other active regulatory items where our teams are spending an, an inordinate amount of time uh, in these last several months. If I'm going to categorize regulatory activity during this administration, um, I, I, would, I would categorize it as, as a, a revisit of a number of things that I, I think many of us thought were already settled, right? At the beginning of this administration, uh, the, 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 Biden, uh, the, the White House President Biden issued an executive order that said you know, everything issued in essentially the last four years, we're going to take a really hard look at and make sure that those regulations 
regulations comply with our specific set of values, right? And there were a, there was a whole long list. And so what that means is that a number of the agencies are going back through this regulatory process, going back through the six Endangered Species Act regulations, things that affect not only the water and the transportation projects that you rely on, but also how you engage with the Fish and Wildlife Service and in some of those uh, cooperative conservation agreements that a number of you in, in Texas and Oklahoma and certainly Kansas are, are a part of, right? It's everything from how these environmental analyses happen to the resources that are dedicated to veterinary user fees, everything from labor and transportation. The regulation machine has been really, really busy. That's not great news, right? Because a lot of us would rather see fewer regulations, a lot of us would rather see more regulatory flexibility because every case is different. I would bet you that not a single set of you, so you pick two people out of this crowd, every single time your business is going to be different. You are all here because you have common business practices, common business interests, but your businesses are all different. And so specific regulatory activities that target Joe or Sam or Steve, those are not representative of the industry. And so our goal is to make sure that the policies are as flexible as possible while maintaining some sort of, this is the catchphrase here, regulatory certainty, right? The one that I would, I would note for you here uh, is, uh, is especially in the transportation space. Uh, we, we did see through COVID a number of uh, exemptions through the, uh, for the hours of service rule for, for transporting uh, cows and other agricultural practices, things that were in, in involved in the food supply chain uh, through this country. That hours of service exemption uh, was not extended this last week and so we are going to see hours of service kick in. But it is important for, for those of you who are, are, are taking cattle uh, or, or any other ag product uh, around the, the country, especially in a space as, as, as big as this part of the country, we do see an, an ELD delay until the 15th of December. Uh, you know, this is not my area of expertise, and, and so I am uh, I'm relaying information from our team, but there is an expected extension likely to that ELD provision. When you get into the Western United States, you are taking cows and corn and a whole bunch of products a really long way. And so these kind of transportation sureties are really important. Now the other piece that I, I know that a number of you are invested in and, and certainly a number of your Western counterparts uh, are the rail conversations that are ongoing, right? You know that that transportation has a potential to affect a, a significant portion of the beef supply chain. Now those rail negotiations, those, those labor unions are negotiating. Uh, now I would probably need more fingers to count all of the, the, the labor unions. A number of them have already ratified the deal, uh, the, the agreement. Uh, to be able to avoid a, a rail strike. There is one union who has failed to ratify, and I think about four or five uh, who have upcoming meetings to determine whether they're going to ratify. Uh, that we don't see uh, a rail delay uh, or a rail strike in this country. Whether we're talking about port security, other transportation backups, we know how quickly, especially in the beef supply chain, some of those delays can, can have an impact. Uh, and for those of you who are really on, on the beginning end of that supply chain, the impact for all of you is, is top of mind for all of us. So we talked about the courts, right? And, and the courts are not just the Supreme Court, right? There are a number of other courts around the country where NCBA is engaged in cases on predator management, on land use plans, on a number of things. We talked about the, some of the regulatory items that we, that we see ongoing in the, in the city. And so there is one piece of this that we haven't yet talked about. And that's usually the, the part that generates the most interest concern in Washington, and that's what Congress is doing. Now, Congress has, has been interesting, right? Um, and, and much like your business models, uh, the, the success or the perceived success of Congress is not who has control of the House, is not who has control of the Senate, it's not even who really is in those seats. Now, membership is important, right? Your, your elected officials are important, don't get me wrong. 
But the real important thing is that math. If you do not have 60 members who are willing to vote for a bill in the Senate, it's not going anywhere. If you don't have a majority in the House of Representatives, we're not going anywhere. And so that math is incredibly important. And so when we get to some of the election discussion later this morning, remember that math, because that math is really going to determine what the next two years looks like. The, the past two years, the margins have been incredibly close. In the Senate, we have a 50-50 split. And so you are depending on a small number of, of, of members who cross that political affiliation line on any given issue. Inordinate attention has been given to Senator Joe Manchin, from West Virginia, a Democrat who has been willing to vote with Republicans on a number of issues. The same attention has been given to Kristen Sinema from Arizona, who's willing to vote with Republicans on a number of issues. In the previous Congress, the script was flipped a little bit. Senator Susan Collins of Maine, a Republican, voted with Democrats in, in a number of issues. So did Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. And so you, you have this dynamic where political parties essentially come down to the willingness of a, of a caucus or the ability to keep a political caucus together. When you have a 50-50 split, or 49-51, or 48-52, or anything in that realm, it makes bipartisan legislation the only way to go. It's not because of political affiliations. It's not really even because of, of what issues we're discussing. It, it is basic math. Um, and so thankfully, we have a number of people in our office who are much better at math than I am. Didn't hire me to do math, but, uh, but we, we put our fingers and toes together. Uh, and, and our whip counts on legislation are incredibly important. In the House, you see a little bit more of a margin, but you also see an interesting dynamic because when you have 435 members of the House of Representatives and you have almost a 50-50 split or you know a, a little margin of error either direction, what you see is a split of the caucus, right? The Democrats have sort of their core, more traditional leadership, and then they have a progressive wing. The Republicans have a, a more core, established membership, and then they have the Freedom Caucus, right? Those caucuses are divided based on regional affiliation, sometimes length of service, and they can be divided on a number of issues, too. So when we look at the legislative countdown, all of those things that need to happen before the end of the year continue to depend on basic math. And the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about is what we are looking at before the end of the year. Right? Before the end of the year, um, again, I, I, I didn't put my fingers and toes to use, but we have uh, in, in the low double digits legislative days before we adjourn for Christmas. That's because in the month leading up to the elections, both chambers adjourn. They adjourn to facilitate those campaign activities. Immediately after the election, we have the session called the lame duck, right? Uh, where one party potentially is, uh, is, is going to be in, in the majority for the first time. But all of those members who didn't get elected still come back to work before the transition before the transition of, of seats happens in January. And this year in the lame duck, like so many years in the past, we need to see a funding bill. Now, typically, because Congress runs on a, a fiscal year that starts October 1st, uh, typically we see committees try to put together those funding priorities ahead of, of that, that deadline, right? Because otherwise we uh, all watch the news and we all hear speculation on whether the government is going to shut down. And not a partisan statement, but it is never a good idea for the government to shut down. Because as much as we want the government to stay out of all of our business, right, it is much harder for a government to get started again after shutting, spending a whole bunch of time and resources shutting down than it is for things to keep rolling. Momentum is a powerful thing, especially in a government where it is, it is so big, right? So what we saw, because those funding bills for fiscal year 23 didn't get across the finish line before October 1st, what we saw was a continuing resolution, keeping all of the last year's funding levels and priorities prorated for a, significant, for a certain portion of the upcoming next fiscal year. 
that continuing resolution expires on December 16th. So in addition to the other things that might ruin Christmas in the regulatory space this year, we're going to see a government trying, a Congress trying to figure out whether they can come to agreement on how to fund the government past December 16th. Now I am not a betting lady, right? But I do not believe uh, that this Congress is going to be motivated to shut down the government or fail to come to an agreement. Um, again, it's, it's not really good for anybody, and certainly from a political perspective. If you have two houses, perhaps, that are in Democrat control with the White House, uh, and you have all three of them in alignment, it's a really bad look going into the second half of an administration to shut down the government because you can't control the, the members of your own party, right? Now, if the House flips and Republicans take control or the Senate flips or, or stays the same, uh, even that motivation to shut down the government is going to be quite small, right? You're going to want to find an agreement because going into this next two years, we know that a lot of those political candidates already have their eyes set on that 2024 White House. So all of that is a really long way of saying, I don't think we're going to shut down in December, right? Congress can always prove me wrong, but I don't think that that's a risk. What's a bigger risk uh, is the level of urgency to get those fiscal 23 appropriations done and include a whole bunch of trash along with it, right? And so where we're going to be spending a lot of our time, where we continue to prioritize our inclusions of the priorities that are important to us, that will make sure that you have regulatory certainty, that you, the funding is delivered for programs that affect your business, and keeping a lot of those other things out as well. There are a lot of things that can happen in an appropriations bill, especially when you package them in strange ways. But our goal for fiscal, 320, fiscal 23 appropriations is to make sure, first, the government doesn't shut down, second, that we have our priorities included, and third, to make sure that we are not going through this battle again in March or in April. Now again, I am not a betting lady, uh, but, but my analysis tells me that if we see uh, any sort of, of significant political shift in this election cycle, in this midterm election cycle, what we're likely to see is a short-term continuing resolution until April, maybe March of next year, so that gives it a little, everybody a little bit of extra room to negotiate again. And that gets us into another big spending piece, or at least another authorization piece. So let's talk a little bit about the Farm Bill, right? The Farm Bill has taken up a lot of air for ag producers across the country this year and into next year. Uh, we have seen a fairly limited uh, set of activities uh, related to the 2023 Farm Bill in the House. It's essentially the House's turn to write the Farm Bill, right? And so the House typically starts with some oversight hearings into an exploration of what worked well from the last Farm Bill and what we need to change this time. They provide some oversight. They do some of their own investigations. And we've seen a limited amount of that this year. Part of that's political, right? Um, House Republicans on, on the Ag Committee probably aren't super motivated to, to, to do a lot of activity, to, to write their own bill uh, if they're not going to see a, a change in the majority this fall. And House Democrats have been focused on a number of, of other items that sort of tee up the Farm Bill conversation but aren't the more traditional oversight hearings. So where do we fit into all of this, right? Where do cattle producers fit in? Because you know we, we talk about a lot of corn and cotton in the Farm Bill, but the cattle component is just as important. So NCBA's priority for the 2023 Farm Bill are, are fourfold, right? There are a number of animal health provisions that are particularly important. Whether we're talking about the vaccine bank or we're talking about the, the national labs, uh, we saw in fiscal 18 through 22 a static 120 million over that four year period for implementation of these three key programs. Now, I know a lot of you feel the impacts of inflation, right? The government does too, these programs do too. And so as we are assessing what these programs need in order to be functional for all of you, to be functional for the industry, that's baked into some of these requests as well. 
We want to see this funding split out, 30 million uh, through fiscal 23 for the uh, animal health labs, and a significant investment in that, uh, that, that disease and vaccine bank. Now, we put it here as the foot and mouth disease bank because you know while there is uh, opportunity to include other vaccines in this space, right now it's, it's pretty FMD focused. And I think, you know, again, being, being from the West and, and working with some of our partners in Washington, I think there is, is going to be a significant level of attention on this vaccine bank because I'll, I'll tell you, avian influenza has a lot of people scared and has a lot of people scared for the, the and has a lot of people planning, perhaps, for what it looks like to, to make sure that the vaccine bank is both robust and functional for our industry and the other demands that might be placed on it. This second one is in my team's wheelhouse, right? These voluntary conservation programs. And this is where I want to step back to sort of the larger administration proposals and priorities, right? In this space, NCBA's general policy uh, is to make sure that we are providing some, um, some space and some security against federal overreach, right? This administration, I think, heard that loud and clear. You know, the proof is in the pudding with these regulations, right? But there's been a lot of messaging from this administration to incentivize and reward producers, especially private landowners, ag producers, forest owners, for the good work that you already do, right? Right? One of my uh, mentors always told me that he didn't raise beef, he raised grass. And he put up hay and he made sure that those feed inputs were the highest quality so that he could grow the highest quality beef for his area. And these voluntary conservation programs get to the beginning of that cycle, right? Your land and resource stewardship that allows you to make the most of the highly specialized and highly refined genetics that you've invested in, right? And, and so as we look at some of these conservation programs, making sure that the government isn't trying to regulate you into compliance, but find a way to reward and monetize the conservation practices that you already do. And that's why they call us the C-Team, right? That's why we call, we call ourselves the C-Team, this natural resources team in Washington. Because the work that you already do, the grazing practices, the technology that you already implement, that's conservation. And so we have a primary message, both through the Farm Bill, but also through our generic everyday messaging that the work you do is conservation and that cattle producers, those who invest in this industry, are the original conservationists. The same message carries through through these risk and, and disaster programs as well. We have uh, talked a lot this year about disaster programs, whether it's the hurricane in Florida, the risk of catastrophic wildfire, and I don't think I need to talk to you about drought. These risk management and disaster programs are absolutely key because when you are providing and facilitating the, the highest quality beef production in the world, you need to make sure that you have some protection when Mother Nature just doesn't want to work with you, right? The last piece here is particularly important. Over the years, there has been uh, an inclination to uh, move forward with a livestock title, a specific portion of the Farm Bill uh, that is dedicated solely to livestock. Now, that's uh, NCBA opposes for, for a variety of reasons, right? I think Dr. Peel this morning talked to you uh, about a number of cattle market, uh, not only outlooks for, from a business perspective, but there are a number of, of pieces of legislation and regulatory activities in this space as well. Creating a new title in the Farm Bill would do a couple things. The Farm Bill has a set pot of money, right? There is, you know, Congress says, you know, you can have your 30 buck allowance for the Farm Bill, right? Including a new title in, in that Farm Bill is not going to allow you to plus up to 35 or 37 in the larger scheme of what your allowance is going to be. You're going to be drawing from the same pot of money and potentially including things in a larger package that people have to hold their nose and say, well, this is a must pass, right? This is the danger when you look at fiscal 23 appropriations or any appropriations, right? When you put more things in, it gets real heavy and, and it isn't as nimble as we think it is. There are also a number, I think, of industry discussions. NCBA has been leading uh, not only the charge for, uh, for, for some of these market provisions uh, that would be concerning to see in a livestock title in the Farm Bill. 
And I don't think any of you need a full list of the Title II conservation programs, but I'm throwing them up here anyway. Because just like we see in the other regulatory space, the administration and Congress have a lot of overlap here. And as we move into this 23 Farm Bill scenario, this is going to be one of our primary areas of engagement. And now I'm going to be short, right? Because I promised you that we would talk about the elections, and I did so in, in a little bit of a different way. But the, the short version of what we expect to see in the midterms is wait and see, right? For, for those of us who have been around in Washington for a number of, of years, for those of you who have been watching these election cycles over the last 10, 20, 50 years, you know that anything can happen in the weeks leading up to the election. Now again, I'm not a betting lady, but the science, the math tells me that we are not likely to see a massive shift in either the House or the Senate during this midterm cycle. There are an incredible number of volatile political items that are going to affect key seats, right? That, that we may see, and I think we will see, a change in majority in one or both of the chambers. But we're not going to see the, the kind of landslide, perhaps, that you see in other midterm elections. From a scientific perspective, right? In the midterms, whoever, whichever party holds the White House, they typically lose a significant number of seats in the midterm elections. The midterm elections are often a referendum on how the White House is doing. And I'll tell you that between gas or among gas prices, trade, immigration, health care, a whole bunch of other things, there are a lot of people across the country who are not particularly happy. Either because they think what the White House is doing is not the right path, or because, perhaps in their voter base, the White House isn't doing enough in those spaces. So you have a lot of potential volatility in a midterm cycle. But also what you see is, I think, a fairly changing dynamic. Um, you, you are seeing, and, and I didn't put it up here today, but you are seeing a, a significant shift over the last 20 years away from a, a multi-party representation in states. So what that means is that when you have two senators or when you have a congressional delegation, um, states are becoming more um, homogenous, right? you're very rarely anymore going to see a Republican and a Democrat elected from the same state in the Senate. You're going to see a much larger contingent of one party or the other in a state. It's identifying some regional differences. It identifies, I think, party control and spending in states. Uh, but it also really affects the dynamics of what happens when those members get to Congress. I will tell you that when you see a divided, uh, almost evenly divided chamber, it, is, it makes legislating a heck of a lot harder because you have to get that math just right in order to, for things to pass. But it does radically increase the, the volume of bipartisan drafting of bills for the future. Be likely to see out of the election, I don't know, come back to me on, on two days before the election and I might have a better idea. But there are still about three weeks for opposition research, for family dynamics, thank you Georgia, for a whole lot of things to affect where people are gonna cast their ballot that day. So what does that mean for what we do in Washington, right? You know, there is a lot of volatility. There's up, down, left, right, purple, green, blue, red, affiliations, caucuses develop and, and dissolve all the time in Washington. But our key priorities remain the same. Our policy focus for 2022, and, and arguably I would say beyond, would be to protect and promote the economic, environmental, and social sustainability of this cattle and beef industry. Everything that we do is to allow you to do what you do, to make good money doing it, to provide you market access, to provide you freedom from government overreach through all of these priority areas. And now I've talked to you way longer than I intended to and have said a, a lot of things about Washington. There are a lot of things that I didn't talk about. So for my remaining time, I would be very happy to take questions. Uh, but I want to close by saying thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for enduring some of some pretty interesting conditions over the last several years. And I appreciate the invitation to join you this morning. Don't be shy. So you mentioned in the, the electronic law, 
Yes, yep, so, so the question is whether I think there's going to be an ELD extension past the December 15th uh, current extension deadline. Uh, our policy shop believes that there is. Uh, that extent, we believe that that extension is going to, to extend into 23, right? You know, we've seen months at a time extensions provided. Um, and so how far into 23, uh, I, I don't have the, the insight to tell you how far, but we do expect to see that extension. And with respect to the hours of service, right, NCBA advocated for an additional extension to the hours of service uh, exemption that we have seen through COVID uh, and, and advocated, I think, pretty strongly for another extension as well. Um, the, the challenge is that when, you know, the president tells you that, that COVID is over and COVID, the, the pandemic, was the um, justification for the hours of service exemption, uh, it, makes it, it makes it a little bit more more tough for them politically to, to, to extend. Yes, sir? Can you kind of give us your side of the Capital Cost Discovery Act and what what is the CBA is public? Yeah, and so so the, the the interesting piece, and I this is not my area of expertise, and so um, I am neither an economist uh, nor am I uh, a, a, a market strategist here. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about where we have been uh, on that cattle price transparency act. Uh, we have have seen a number of iterations through um, through this Congress. I think as uh, as the sponsors have have made some adjustments based on hearings that they've had and discussions that they've had. Um, the latest iteration did make some pretty substantial changes and and you know if we if you want after after we leave out of here I can sort of give you the breakdown of what was in and, and out the changes between the versions NCBA is still opposed to to that um, to that bill and you know I, I think it, it often makes a, a pretty sound bite when you, you put a pretty name on a bill right you know that and you know the tagline is that NCBA opposes transparency which is the furthest thing from the truth but you know, when I'm talking to you about um, NCBA's priority to make sure that producers are able to make the most of their market situation, that's really where our opposition comes down to this bill. Um, any sort of mandated situation that, that a producer needs to sell or market their cattle in a specific way um, is, is incredibly restrictive for an industry that varies, varies a lot, right? You know, because I'm in the natural resource space, I typically talk about the difference between raising cows in, in Florida versus Wyoming, right? First time I went to Florida, I couldn't believe that these cows were standing in water up to their knees and didn't have foot rot. Um, but the, the marketing situation is, is different as well. And, and so where you see NCBA engaging is in the, the measures that will create um, transparency and data, uh, like the cattle contract library, not only the USDA pilot, but some of those pieces of legislation as well rather than a directive that you have to use this particular uh, futures contract or you have to sell on cash because all the other people are doing uh, one way or the other, right? And the other piece of this too is that, um, so, so I lead the natural resources team, but our the head of our business team, our vice president for government affairs and our chief counsel are, are currently in Paris uh, to having a number of, of market access conversations with some of our trading partners. Uh, and, and so I am a poor substitute for the market side of this conversation. But let's uh, go back and, and, and I'll get you not only the breakdown of what's changed and, and where our position is, but I'll also connect you with the experts on this who can speak to it um, probably much more directly and much more briefly than, than I can. You guys are letting me off easy this morning. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's the that's the really tough piece, right? And so as we're, I'm, I'm going to give you some additional context before I answer your question directly, because um, you know I'm from Washington and that's what we do. 
Um, but so so as we're as we're looking ahead, I, I think there are there's a really clear recognition not only in Congress but also in the agencies as well that some programs are are oversubscribed, um, and that some programs um, are are going to have a different kind of utility uh, in the next farm bill. A significant number of changes were made to CSP equip um, and even CRP in in the last farm bill um, that that opened the door, I think, for some, some fairly interesting implementation. In terms of whether um, the, the next farm bill, which is I think what you're asking, um, is, is whether the next farm bill, the implementation of EQIP and CRP, uh, is going to increase the, the basis on those acres to uh, entice more people to put those, to, to enroll in those programs. Um, I, I think that maybe I would ask a different question, right? Whether there is going to be splintering off of those programs for CRP, like grassland CRP or the latest pilot uh, in Wyoming to use CRP for wildlife habitat acres, right, you know, a specific subset. I think the question is, is much more whether you're going to see sort of a divergence in different utilization of those tools um, that is going to need legislative recognition. Um, our priority is to make sure that the tools have utility but aren't incentivizing any sort of scheme that would pay a producer to remove production. Grazing is, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an economist, and I'm certainly not a preacher, but if I had a sermon, it would be that grazing is good, right? And so when you have uh, the, when, when you have any sort of either legislative or regulatory proposal that would remove cows from those acres or remove the tools that allow and facilitate the utilization in, in cattle production, um, it, it is concerning. That said, there are a number of conservation tools that are, are, are important, not only for, I think, recognizing the investments that are already made, right? Allowing producers, allowing landowners to have access to things that are, are a little bit of um, in economic contribution and recognition of, of those practices. And so, I, you know, I, I, it is a really long way of saying it's a balance, right? There it has been an, in, an, a massive increase in subscription for CRP and grassland CRP. There's a massive interest by producers, especially after this administration's narrative, to recognize and incentivize those practices. Uh, and I, my focus, my team's focus, is going to be to make sure that we are right-sizing those those tools to make sure that we're not paying people not to produce cattle, but also that there is some recognition. Because I don't know about you, but I think most producers would rather be recognized and, and have some economic contribution for what you do, rather than a, you know, a carrot, rather than a, a regulatory stick on the back end. And if there aren't any more questions, I want to thank you one more time. I appreciate the opportunity to join you. And uh, you have a pretty, pretty good crew here. So I, uh, I hope you have a good rest of your conference. Thank you.